Hi, Tim. Hey, hey Rick. Hey, I noticed recording has already started. Should I stop it and then turn it on right before I start? You're good. I just have all the meetings to start recording when they start. OK. Do I stop it at the end of mine and restart it? No, no you're good. You, you, okay. you're complete. You can just when you're done talking, you can just be done. OK. Go over here to check out. So you should get this background. I like it. This costs about 100 bucks, the logo? 250. Okay. I know what we got. I don't know where we got it. It's uh, X the Owl pissed off. <laughs>
Hey everyone, we're going to start it here in just a couple minutes. We'll just wait for some more folks to jump on. All right, we're going to get started here. So if you um, please mute your mic um, for right now. Uh, later on, when we have questions, we can uh, you can unmute and ask questions later on. We also have another facility for you to ask questions as well. So um, so today uh, in this session, we're going to talk about what's new in Azure SQL Managed Instance. And uh, I have uh, a poll or two for you to, guys to participate in. So while we're uh, while I'm talking here for the next minute or two, if you want to get out your phone um, or op just open up another browser and go to menti.com, uh, there'll be a code for you to enter in or, or, or a QR code you can scan with your phone uh, to get right into the poll. So, um, so look for that opportunity in just a minute. And this is not advancing. Why not? There it is. Okay, so um, a little bit real quick about me. Uh, my name is Rick Higgis. I'm a senior consultant in the Azure cloud and AI domain within Microsoft Consulting Services. Before joining Microsoft, I was uh, a data platform MVP for many years and have been very involved with PaaS. Matter of fact, uh, this week has been uh, typically the, the week of the PaaS summit. And uh, you know we're not we're not attending in person this year, which is normal for 2020, of course. Uh, so, but uh, I really um, enjoy working with the folks there at Pass. So please, um, you know, if if um, if you haven't gotten involved with Pass yet, please do so. It's going to be great. Uh, but I also, I'm still very involved with Pass. Um, I speak at SQL Saturday events and the summit at times, uh, so it's this, just a little bit, a little bit about me in a nutshell. So um, today's agenda, we are uh, basically we're doing the introduction. We're going to get to the poll in a second. Um, we're going to do a really quick, really quick manage instance overview. I have two slides on it, so that way. Uh, if, if you're not real familiar with managed instance yet, you know, hopefully this will give you a little taste of what what it is and how why it's different from the other SQL offerings. And also, th then we'll get into what's new. And there's a lot of stuff that's been new over the past year. Um, managed instance continues to evolve and change. Uh, so th sometimes I'm not even aware of some of the stuff that has been coming out. And I try, try to stay very in tune with uh, the announcements. And then we'll have a time for questions. So what I'd like for you to do is you can scan that QR code and I'm going to actually change my sharing. And so go to that, uh, if you go to that, if you go to menti.com and enter that code 3096491, or you can scan that QR code that is going to 
um, basically take you to a page that looks very similar to what you see on your screen here. And let me come up here. All right, you see that? Good. Let me go back. I need to tab over to the actual one here. Okay. So, um, so go ahead and enter the code in. And uh, when you're in, if you could just click on one of those little buttons there, you know, thumbs up or the question mark or the heart or whatever, just let me know that we got some people in there. As you can see, we got a couple people hit it on there. All right, cool. All right, we got some people. All right. I'm going to go to the next uh, slide, if you will, within this uh, Menti presentation and open up the polls. And basically what I want you to do is rate yourself from uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And so the very first one is I have a solid understanding of SQL Server Database Engine. If you strongly agree, click over here. If not, click over here. Um, second one is have a good understanding of HA and DR technologies on a SQL Server. Um, the next one is I have a good understanding of the concepts of PaaS benefits. And then also I have a I have worked with Azure SQL Database, like the singleton version of it. Or I have worked with managed instance. So OK, good. as I see people responding here and you can see the results up here. So looks like many of you have some really good background in SQL Server. And uh, many of you looks like that have uh, worked with managed instance. So that's great. You're in the right spot. All right, let's go on to as close the voting here and go on to the next one. And this is basically what role are you currently in? Um, you know, you can type stuff like DBA, consultant, developer, BI guy, stuff like architect. Yep, that's great. DBA, data architect, architect. Great. Okay, go ahead and keep entering your roles in. Admin. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, manager. All right. Good. And, and and basically with the word cloud, the more people who enter the same in the, the same thing in, the bigger and more centered it is. So. Looks like we have a lot of DBAs uh, and some architects. Cool, very good, great. Well, welcome and welcome to Azure Data Fest if this is your first session of the day. So we're going to go back to the presentation. All right, so whenever we're talking about um, managed instance, one thing that I want you to be aware of it, well, several things I want you to be aware of, and that is um, managed instance is a PaaS offering. So in other words, in exchange for some high availability built in and automated backups and automated patching and really easy to configure DR, right? Those things are sometimes hard in some organizations, but because that's part of the offering, uh, there's just some things that are just not in your control. And, you know, it's just, you know, because there are certain things that we need to do in order to maintain SLAs, there are just some things that you don't have control over. So that's number one. So when we start, when we talk about all this stuff, managed instance, say, I don't have as much control over this. The next thing I want you to remember is that some things are just different in the cloud, not necessarily worse, not necessarily better, but just different. And that's because of the way that the cloud has been assembled and how the parts work together and that it just it is just different in, in many in many ways uh, from that point of view. Uh, the third thing I want you to remember is that if it can't be changed, understanding why you can't change it or maybe how or how it's been architected, maybe I can get around that that little thing I couldn't control or at least in the same way I used to and be able to get to a solution. And the last thing I want you to remember during the session 
is that managed instance is really SQL Server underneath the covers. In other words, the, the same core bits that you use on SQL Server on premises today is the same bits that are running in managed instance. Matter of fact, they're even later and better, more st more stable than the bits that you're running on prem. So uh, keep that in mind uh, during during this session. And get back up here. All right. So really quick, um, managed instance is a PaaS offering, as as we mentioned before. Um, and I think it's kind of like the, a bridge between the Azure SQL database offering and the um, the normal SQL Server on-prem or on a VM offering. So I like this picture because it gives you a good feel of the surface area that you have. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, Object Explorer from SQL Server Management Studio, and I have some uh, databases and security exploded out so you can see all the things that are available underneath there. And on the right hand side, I have Azure SQL database. I'm connected to my virtual server, which has many Azure SQL databases underneath it. But as you can see, the surface area is very minimal compared to what I'm used to dealing with with on-prem. So right there in the middle, the Goldilocks thing, right? Not too hot, not too cold, but just right, if you will, is managed instance. And so as you can see, the surface area is actually pretty close to having full control over your, your over your SQL Server on a VM installation, right? Com compared to Azure SQL Database. So, oh, I want to get this notion across that you know the the scope, the surface area that you have is an instance of SQL Server that you're running. So that that is, um, you know, hopefully you understand that. Yes, I can't control everything, but I can control a whole heck of a lot of things. So, um, the next thing I want to this is slide two of two for my high level overview of managed instance are the tiers. So, there's general purpose tier and there's business critical tier. So, for general purpose, you have what I call the green MI, our green compute, if you will, our that does all the reads and writes, and that has a little bit of local SSD for TempDB, but all the storage is basically on a remote premium storage account, which is also which is also all SSDs. So if something bad happens to my compute, then it will switch over to my failover MI, which is in yellow, and so it will go through crash recovery and come back up and running in about a minute or so. So very similar to failover cluster instance that you have on prem uh, so it fills over and everything's great there and by the way you, you don't see that yellow mi at all you just see the green one um, for business critical tier um, it is what i think of i think of it as similar to a always on availability group uh, with four nodes in it we have our primary node or green node if you will uh, which does all the reason rights um, all the storage for my business critical is super fast local SSDs. So that means that each one of my nodes has a full copy of my database and they're all synchronous. So they're all synchronized together. My two yellow ones are there for failover. My, my purple one is a read scale out. So basically for business critical, um, I have four copies of my database, one read write, one one read and two for failover. So when a failover event does happen, it's on the order of five to ten seconds. So uh, as far as features are concerned, uh, besides the scale out read node that you have there, um, Business Critical can do in memory LTP tables. You cannot do that on general purpose. Other than that, the feature set is exactly the same between Business Critical and general purpose. So if you don't need in-memory LTP tables, if you don't need a scale out secondary, readable secondary, general purpose uh, is going to do great for you. It's very similar to enterprise edition features that you're used to on prem for both for both tiers. All right. So what's new? 
And what I'm going to do here um, for what's new, let me try to get this set up right here so I can see what's going on here. Get back over here. Um, so I have another code for you to, to use. It's uh, again, fermenti.com. Uh, if you scan that QR code, you'll get to the to this area where you can start entering in questions. And I have a separate screen over here to my right so I can see questions come in. Um, but if you enter that code, if you it's 3869876 or scan that QR code and you can get in there and start entering questions as we go along. So I just wanted to get this up in front of you now so you can enter questions as we go along. So um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, about what's new, are currently in public preview. So that means, what does that mean? Well, one thing is, is that all previews are excluded from uh, Microsoft SOAs and warranties. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, previews might not include customer support from Microsoft, and a preview might not be brought forward into general release status. Um, however, just want to point out that if you're looking at the documentation and you see some of this public preview, ask your Microsoft rep about it because some public preview features are basically almost fully baked. And what I mean by that is that there might be some part of it that may not have been uh, presented yet or gone through full code review, but as but you get production level support. Uh, for example, um, I believe instance pools is still in uh, public preview. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it has production support. At least I believe it does have to double check on that. But what that means is it hasn't gone GA yet because um, they ha don't have the portal interface finished for it. You can do everything with, with instance pools through PowerShell or the Azure Cloud um, command line, but they just haven't finished up the the portal experience yet for it. So, um, so when you see that something public preview, it it could mean that it's almost baked, if you will. And I heard someone uh, with your mic on. If you can, please uh, mute your mic. All right. So now we get into really some some new stuff. This is. Uh, when I heard about this, I was like, this is so great because this is one of the pain points that my customers experience sometimes after um, after going live with uh, their workloads on managed instance. And that is um, there is a, um, a, a log rate limit that they've imposed on managed instance. And basically it's three megabytes per second per V core, and that has actually unchanged, but it used to be capped at 22 megabytes per second. Now they've increased to 120 megabytes per second. So why did they have this capped in the first place? Well, because remember Microsoft, because we're this is a PaaS offering, we're saying, hey, we're gonna be responsible for high availability and backups and you know, point in time uh, restorers, right? Up to a certain point. So we needed to limit some things like log throughput rates so we can make sure that we were able had enough horsepower if you will on the back end to do those backups consistently uh, same thing so that so general purpose um, limits were vastly lifted the, the cap was vastly in, increased and uh one for business critical was doubled and also the iops rate that was throttled at two and a half k is now 4,000 IOPS. So what this translates into is just by, and you didn't have to do anything for this to happen. This happened as an automatic update. And, that, and that's something else you need to think about for managed instance because it's PaaS offering. There's going to be constant updates going on in the background, and you don't have to do anything in order to take advantage of these things. So for a transactional workload, a TPC C, uh, workload, um, on general purpose was about two to three times faster. Um, or, th or the throughput was 
two to three times more than it was before. For a more analytical workload, the execution time was 23% less. The scans uh, were about twice as, as good. And when we talk about data ingestion, about getting data into the system, it was two to three times faster because they lift these limits of the log rates. So, um, you know, and actually I talked to a customer I had a year ago and I said, hey, you know, are things running faster? And they go, yeah, but we don't know why. And uh, and because they did not hear about this announcement that they did this change. So uh, it is a, um, you know, this is a, a great thing for uh, customers, especially after they go live, because now uh, things will be, won't be as, uh, so, uh, slowly improved. Um, also, uh, TempDB, very similar to the, the log rate um, caps as well. Um, but and basically, uh, they've improved the TempDB performance as well to you know, make things like sorts and spills, uh, loading data if you lo load data into TempDB, um, all faster. So that is definitely a... Um, Okay, and um, another this is another thing that uh, customers like too. Except you do have to do some work to take advantage of this, though, um, and that is global VNet pairing support. So basically, whenever um, part of the architecture for DR for managed instances is what we call um, failover groups. And so basically your entire instance is being replicated over to another Azure region where you have another managed instance running. And so basically it's always constantly up to date. I think the RPO is five seconds. So there's about five second latency between the two. But, um, it, but prior to this support here for global VNet peering, uh, you had to set up uh, VPNs uh, and gate, gateways between the two VPNs um, in order to get your subnets to talk to each other either that way or you could use express route and that's actually how a customer of mine was configured before where they had express route to both regions and uh, so basically their traffic was going from the Azure region down to their data center and back up to the other data region so um, which is, you know, they wanted to, to be, uh, be in that type of uh, configuration. Um, however, now with global VNet peering, uh, you can take advantage of the Azure backbone, high-speed Azure backbone between the, the two regions in order to um, have the field communicate with each other. So this is, this is big. Now, that little star at the bottom of the screen which says, hey, uh, supported in newly created subnets only. So that means if you currently have a managed instance with failover groups already configured, um, you need, it's, it's basically a migration to another new managed instance uh, um, with a failover group on that as well in order to take advantage of it. So it isn't a, an easy transition. There's gonna be some work if you already have an existing architecture, but it will. Uh, I think it's be worth it to take advantage of this. Um, something else that's uh, that's very um, basically makes you relax a little bit more, and that is wh whenever you do um, what we call long running operations for the management of the managed instance. For example, you want to make it bigger or make it smaller or delete it or create it, right? Those type of things usually take hours in order for it, it to complete. Uh, now you, first, when you, um, let's say you need, want to go from, you know, eight feet cores to 16 cores. Um, now the, the actual switch is just a blip of connectivity going from eight cores to 16 cores. But to build that 16 V core managed instance up in the first place will take about three hours before it will complete. But during that time, you're like 
okay, I submitted the request, what's going on? Is it actually running? Is it doing anything, right? So now there's an interface that will show us where it is in the process. In this case here, this is a creation of a new MI where it said, yeah, we, we completed step one, the validation is completed. We're currently building the cluster and then step three has not been started yet, which is starting up the instance, et cetera. So um, this will give us a little more peace of mind that something actually is happening and something didn't break along the way. So uh, that is new as well. Um, backup storage. Um, so whenever, so until recently, um, all your backup storage what defaulted and went to a read accessible geo redundant storage account. OK, and we still recommend that for production purposes. OK, that way that if something bad happens inside of that Azure region, you still have access to your backups on your geo redundant storage. So so we still recommend that. However, there are some cases where we had customers come to us and say, hey, I can't allow my data to be replicated over to, um, you know, outside the borders of our country or outside the borders of Europe. Okay, so so they wanted it for data sovereignty reasons. And we've had other customers say, you know what, I have a production instance and I have, you know, a couple of non-production instances. And I don't want to pay for backup storage of geo, you know, the geo redundant nature when local would just be, you know, would be just fine. So we've made that adjustment. Uh, so when it, this is only upon the creation time of your managed instance, you can choose this. You can choose what type of storage account you want to use. So, and that will help with costs and data sovereignty. Um, something else that is new just recently is the Azure AD authentication configuration for non admin privileges. And especially whenever you're working inside a large organization um, and there's so many controls and there's very few people who have a global admin or privilege role, um, this makes it so much easier to get that managed instance um, into Azure AD or connected to Azure AD so that your Azure AD authentication will work. So, but, but um, so again, great news for very large organizations who have lots of complicated security requirements. Um, also, machine learning is now also available within managed instance. So, if you've been using R and Python within SQL Server on-prem, that is now supported in managed instance as well. So that means you can do the, your prep and processing, you can do your training of your models and deploy those models into production. So um, th there is, you know, so basically it's trying to keep pace. And when I say, yes, the, the bits are later, uh, that are deployed with the managed instance, but sometimes not all the features are deployed until a need is actually seen uh, to be met, to be needed. Um, also, this is something else that we've had lots of requests for from customers, and that is, uh, you know, they want to move to the cloud, and they said, but I have on my SQL Server, I'm moving up to the cloud, I have uh, the SSRS, uh, you know, the report server database and the report server tempdb. And can I host those on my managed instance because I'm, I don't want to have another SQL server running in Azure. I want to move it to managed instance. So managed instance is, is not, uh, does not uh, serve up reports, okay? But it holds a repository for reporting services to interface with it in order to get those reports. So in, in other words, managed instance is still just the database engine. But if you 
still have lots of SQL SSRS reports that you need to uh, run and maintain, you can have those reporting services databases hosted on your um, on your MI. So it is a um, and it is for all supported versions of SQL Server reporting services. So that would mean 2012 or four, no 14 because 12 is out of mainstream support. So I think it's 2014 later, definitely 2016, 2017 would be supported uh, for this as well. OK, um, just a reminder, uh, put this slide in here in case people are coming in late or didn't get the uh, note on where to ask questions. So if you go to menti.com and enter the code 38 six nine eight seven six or scan that qr code you'll get to the place where uh, we have some questions and i see that there are some rolling in already thank you very much we will get those get to those uh shortly um distributed transactions now uh whenever we've been working with customers uh moving them to managed instance this has been one of the blockers um not was it has not been a high volume of blockers but for systems that need distributed transactions this was definitely a blocker so now um they've enabled basically a, a way to do tra uh, distributed transactions across multiple sql server managed instances so um, historically, the distributed transaction coordinator has been part of Windows and SQL Server basically interface with that um, uh, service from Windows in order to coordinate the transactions across multiple databases. So right now it's in uh, public preview and it's for MI so you can have SQL MI spread out across the world and you can have them interface with each other and do coordinated transactions um, amongst each other. So it's uh, the syntax is basically the same that you've been using inside uh, you know, DTC transactions uh, that you're used to. It's just using a little different tact on getting this complete. So you don't have to change your code. It's just a way of uh, doing distributed transactions across multiple in, multiple managed instances. Um, user initiated HA failover. Okay, so um, basically, and this is, I remember uh, I was in a session at, at PASS uh, a couple of years back and the has some you know, Microsoft folks talking about managed instances and at the end people were asking questions and one of the questions that people asked were saying hey can I do a HA failover in other words whether it's you know general purpose you know I'm going to fail over to that other yellow node right or um, for business critical I want to try out um, failing over to one of my failover nodes to see you know to, to test it to make sure it works because I need to maybe uh, certify that I've tested a failover um, before you could not do that. Uh, the closest thing you could get to it would be to do a resize operation um, to a higher number of vCores and scale back down to your normal size uh, because that would actually initiate a failover uh, within the same region to another managed instance that's running. Uh, so now you can actually um, do a you can initiate the failover on your on your own, if you will, to test it out. So one of the things um, you, you know about 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 this right, now, and it's again this is in preview right now. So there isn't a portal experience for this, but there is you know PowerShell and CLI uh, to to allow you to do this. SCOM. So a lot of organizations use uh, System Center Operations Manager to 
monitor their systems within their purview. Um, so this is, had been a long time coming and finally earlier this year, I think it was over the summer, they did the uh, SQL MI management pack. And so what this uh, part of what it does is it does um, automatic discovery. So it can search out the networks that your SCOM has access to in order to find uh, MIs. And it monitors the database engine, uh, databases, space, jobs, you know, stuff like that, failover groups, uh, authentication mode. So it gives you the same type of management experience you have with SQL Server uh, with managed instance. So that has been a long time coming as well. Um, also in public preview, auditing of Microsoft support operations in Azure SQL MI. So basically, um, if you want to basically audit uh, what the, your, the CSS guys do whenever they come in and to work with your managed instance, you can actually do that uh, with this with this um, option that they're offering. And you can either do a log analytics option or an event hub option in order to actually see you know, what data is being exposed to uh, the Microsoft support personnel. And there's another feature that's in public preview right now. I think, do I have it on here or not? I don't know if I have another slide on. But it's called Lockbox, and we'll talk about that later. Um, instance pools. This was put in public preview about a year ago. And the way, so, so if you remember, um, for Azure SQL Database, we also had something called Elastic Pools, which basically gave us a pool of resources and we could have multiple Azure SQL databases within that pool of sharing the same resources. And this is kind of the same concept where we're going to have a pool of resources and we want to share those resources among multiple um, managed instances. And so the way I kind of think of this as, um, you know, if you have a regular on-prem uh, uh, on server and instances of SQL Server running on that server, that's what I kind of relate this to, except that there is more isolation built in because the resources, et cetera, are allocated on a per managed instance basis of this pool, whereas like with an an elastic pool for Azure SQL databases, those the isolation uh, is fuzzier, if you will, um, in that it can if it needs more resources, it can grab them. It does it doesn't need resources and give them up. And that's different from this. This is pretty much you still have dedicated resources. You can divide them up. Um, so I can take like a eight V core um, instance pool and make that into four two v core managed instances and so i still have the ram being associated with the v core which is 5.1 gigabytes per v core i still have the the um, hundred database limit as general pur purpose tier only um, and the billing is at the entire pool level and not the individual managed instance level which is sometimes why people want to have separate managed instances for billing. Um, so you have the potential noisy navy, noisy neighbor problem because it is sh sharing one VM, if you will, um, or one set of resources, but it's not, it's, but they're still fairly isolated. Um, and the other nice thing about this is that your instances within the instance pool can be in failover groups. So that way, if you need to be more granular with what you want to have in a failover group, this might be a great solution for you because you can have, you know, uh, fewer databases in the, in, let's say a two V core um, instance and have that fell over by itself uh, for like DR testing, for example, is a great um, solution for that. Probably in time, because 20 minutes, okay. So this is kind of what, um, instance pool architecture would look like. 
So on the left-hand side is what an instance pool would look like. I could have, for example, 16 V cores, and I could s s slice them up into, in this case, uh, six um, two V core instances and one four V core instance, and have that all inside an instance pool. Um, where typically what I've had to been able to, had to do in the past was each one of the um, you know, underneath the covers, everything is running on a VM. And so I have each instance is on its own VM, where again, with instance pools, I have a lot of instances running on the same VM. So again, it's, it's a trade off sometimes, you know, of what might be good for your situation versus others. So here's kind of a list of uh, current public preview features. Um, that uh, are currently running. We hit most of these. We didn't talk about threat detection yet. Uh, that's currently in public preview. Um, also, long-term backup retention is in public preview. And for some of these, like I said some of these things in public preview, they're really are almost fully baked. They don't have like the the Azure portal experience. So they say, hey, it's like production, just so we don't have this one little bit done. But we'll take care of you, type of thing. Um, some other uh, things that um, updates were the service aided subnet con configuration, um, transparent data encryption with bring your own key that it has has been updated recently. Auto failover groups that was about a year ago when that came into play. Um, global trace flags and instance level collation. That and time zone choice. Those were actually this been about a year and a half ago now, for th those two for um, instance level collation and time zone choice. So there's continued updates and work going on for managed instance. So we're almost done with the so we so we're done with pretty much. Hey, what's new? So what could be coming? This is not on a particular roadmap whatsoever. Um, I went to the to connect and start getting the most popular items that have been listed on you know, as customer requests for managed instance. So this list is not necessarily things that are promised, but these but this list has things on it that people have asked for and you can go to connect and upvote them as well. So one of the, th so let's just go through this list. Um, pause or stop SQL agent. Um, right now for managed instance, yes, we have SQL server agent, uh, but it you can't stop it. It just runs and runs and runs. So there are occasions where you may want to stop SQL agent. So that's been a request. Or, or pause managed instance. And this is something that, um, you can do with uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, now part of Synapse. Um, you can you know, pause your your compute basically to save money. Uh, right now, that is not um, not you know you can't you can't do that now. You can scale down, but of course, scaling down is a long running process, so it may not really make sense to scale and manage this is down overnight, for example, but. It's something that pe that people have asked for. Um, people also to uh, to make the backup portable to earlier versions of SQL Server, so that they have a failback option in case um, they don't you know they go live with with managed instance and things just aren't as rosy as they seem, or maybe they find some some something wrong they can't do and they need to go back to their older version. Um, that's something that they've asked for. Also. You know, maybe I don't want to have a dev box that is a managed instance. Maybe I want to have that on SQL Server 2019. I'd like to be able to take some data from my production system and put it on my in my dev box. So things like like that, uh, where are reasonable ask right to do do that. Um, enable Polybase in MI. Um, I think that's probably a higher priority than link server to non SQL Server. Service servers, 
non SQL sources, I should say. So Oracle, you can't do a link server to Oracle or to an Excel spreadsheet even. Um, so, but I think Polybase will probably come before link servers to other sources. Um, make MI an always on availability group replica from an on-prem AG. There has been some talk about this and there's been outreach to customers on that, but it would not be basically two ways. It would be more of a migration path going to um, to MI. Um, people will ask for a customer maintenance window or notification when one is going to happen. Uh, the customers ask for more RAM per vCore. That probably won't happen until another hardware generation iteration. Uh, more than 100 databases per instance. There's some limits there that we can't get around, but we might that might be able to go higher. Uh, proximity placement groups for your um, for for your uh, business critical ones. Add, add tagging to databases on the managed instance and not just the managed instance itself for auditing and reporting purposes. Private link, cross instance service broker, log replay API, support DNS aliasing of an Azure SQL managed instance, at least for um, a public endpoint. So the, these are you know, things I've collected from the Connect website to say, you know, these are um, these aren't the top ten or whatever, but they're fairly popular that I've seen out there. And that's one thing I want to get across is the more the more you you know tell the product group that you want something, and a lot more people will agree with you, then the more apt they're going to make the change. Uh, and I have another slide deck where I've I created two years ago and I had like limitations on there and things been people asking and I keep crossing things out almost to the point where I need to make a new slide deck because um, they've knocked out so many items that people have asked for. So, I, you know, please continue to share your input with the uh, uh, customers. I mean, with our product group, sorry. So um, again, go to menti.com and enter the code 3869876 in order to um, or to get there. I'm just looking at something here. Okay. Um, just reading a message there. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, bring the questions over here. And good, it's getting bigger. Good. All right. So uh, let's take a look at the first question. What is the licensing licensing impact on EAs? What are some real life issues and challenges experienced with MI? Agent jobs, link servers, on-prem, Azure connectivity challenges, local AD versus Azure AD, et cetera. Okay, there's a bunch of questions in here. Okay, um, so for uh, licensing impact, uh, what I have to do is really say, talk to your Microsoft rep to understand fully what that impact is. Generally speaking, um, when you are moving, if you have you know, Azure hybrid benefit um, and you have an uh, SA, you know, software assurance, um, you can you know, move SQL licenses to MI. And if you go to, if you have enterprise license, on prem and you've moved to um, general purpose on managed instance that's a one to four mat uh, mapping so you can get four uh, v core licenses for mi for one enterprise license so that's that's pretty good and if, if you go to business critical it's one to one from enterprise to um, to that and if, if you have standard additional licensing it's one to one for general purpose um, so, so that's the difference there for, that's the impact I see on licensing. Uh, some of the real life issues and challenges. Um, so pr probably the one thing that, you know, I, I see from a DBA point of view is they uh, have to get used to kind of a little bit different paradigm. And they say, well, I'm used to checking backups and they don't need to check backups anymore. 
you know, that's one like, one thing from a DBA point of view. Um, also, um, from a point of view of um, because okay, we do have SQL agent running on MI, but it doesn't have SSIS. So SSIS is, has to run somewhere else, maybe another VM, or maybe in self-hosted IR in Azure Data Factory. So there's some other challenges with that that are that are common. Um, also, if you're if you have a database that's been in simple recovery mode and that's what they're used to working in, and then they you bring it to MI, it has to be in full recovery mode. That means that the transactions are are going to be building up um, there. So that could be a difference. Um, understanding the IOs and how to effectively deal with um, IOs and how you map that onto uh, your disks within managed instance. Those are some real life things that I see from that point of view. Uh, from from uh, Azure AD point of view, it's just um, really uh, that's more of an identity thing, getting the two synced, your Windows AD and your Azure AD being synced. Once they're synced, th things work pretty well. Um, but there are some applications that aren't set up for Azure AD, so that's something. So I hope I answered that question. We still have a few minutes left. Um, next question from Sri. How is MI different from Synapse SQL pools? Uh, so for Synapse, Synapse SQL pools, that is within the Synapse scenario where you have access to other compute like Spark, et cetera. Uh, whereas with managed instance, it is basically like a SQL server by, by itself. So it's not really when you equate the two, um, I think they're probably more different than the same other than they both run SQL commands. That's probably the most similar thing between them. Um, next question. Are most customers using MI or SQL DB for that matter, where the app lives on premise? Um, so most customers who are going to migrate to Azure SQL Database or Managed Instance um, usually migrate their app as well to Azure, and that's to deal with, you know, hey, latency and et cetera. Um, and so, so that's one thing that uh, we see there. I, I don't see a lot of customers keeping their apps on premise and putting their data in the cloud. That's usually you want to have your app and your data uh, close. And hey, we see someone on stage. How you doing? You're on camera. I, I think are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Okay, okay, go go ahead. I, yeah, I just I'm just testing stuff and. Okay. You still have eight minutes. All right, thank you. Um, do you see a lot of customers moving their IS SQL servers to SQL MI as a straight replacement to keep access to the agent, yet lose the OS responsibility? Um, yes, we, we we do see a lot of people, uh, you know, pretty much trying to migrate as much as they can to PaaS offerings, not no, just to lose the OS responsibility, but also to take advantage of backups and high availability and easy disaster recovery. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, a, as a consultant over many many years of, you know worked with many different customers and the um, you know there have been in a few situations where uh, they think they have everything set up well from a HA point of view and a DR point of view but they really do not so um, whenever you go to a PaaS offering basically the management doesn't have to worry about hey did I hire the right person or do I do I have the right people in place in order to provide high availability and disaster recovery um, and keep things secure for that matter? Because remember, MI 
is in its own private VNet by default and doesn't have a public access point by default. So it's very secure that way. So it's so when we start you know, talking about people really evolving into the cloud and taking advantage of all that the cloud has to offer, you know, that is really a driving force right there. So great. And I don't see any other questions rolling in. I'll go check the chat box here real quick. I don't see anything over there. So, but, but we have uh, just a couple minutes left. So uh, if anybody has a question they want to ask out loud, uh, you can come off mute for a minute and uh, go ahead and ask. Or perhaps not. All right. Uh, so with that, let me go back over here. Um, so thank you for attending my session here at Azure Data Fest. And there's a lot more to come. I hope you've had a great day so far. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, please do on LinkedIn. It'd be a great way to connect. Just put a little note in there that you attended my session today that will um, we will connect. So. Thank you very much, and I'm going to stop my session in order for the next speaker to come on.